Coming up, classic meets contemporary. A traditional scarf is turning fashionable heads. We meet the guy who made a briefcase for Obama. You know, you're the president. You have people carrying stuff for you. A Canadian-made formal dress gets fans in high places. He's found his perfect muse. It's Sophie Trudeau. And one of America's oldest sneakers gets a custom makeover. Full on Rastafarian colors. Red, black, green, and yellow. This is Style Factory. Not long ago, the trusty leather briefcase was a boring box stuffed with contracts, calculators, and spare white collar shirts. All business, no style. A briefcase for me will always signify a businessman, especially when you think about a London businessman with his umbrella, his bowler hat, and his briefcase. But man, how times have changed. I think that a lot of manufacturers have learned how to take something old, modernize it, and make it sexy. The Frank Clegg English briefcase in tan leather is a classic yet modern briefcase. Finished with brass hardware, built to give you the confidence to own any boardroom, wherever you are. In my briefcase, I usually have, uh, damn, what do I have in my briefcase? Well, just like work stuff. Pens and phone chargers, tablet, maybe snacks. Tic Tacs, lip gloss. This is Clegg, Frank Clegg. He's been making quality leather bags with his bare hands for over 45 years. Just decided to try this for a while to see if it worked out. And I'm still seeing if it works out. <laughs> He's being modest because one customer is high profile and very powerful. So I get a call from the White House one day and they wanted to buy a briefcase and it was gonna be for Mr. Obama, and they ordered one. We made it just like we did everything else. So, no biggie there. Obama's briefcase? I think you're gonna find secrets of the world. I feel like Obama's probably just carrying the briefcase around for style. You know, you're the president. You have people carrying stuff for you. The tanned leather hides live in Clegg's Massachusetts factory and are carried to the cutting area by Frank's son, Andrew. Lucky we got pretty good hides. Um, so for example, I got scarring, a couple of little tick bites. You got some fat wrinkles. Some people don't find them as appealing, but it, to me it adds kind of more of a character to the bag in itself. Areas with scarring and tick bites won't be cut. And as you can see, Andrew's just as passionate about leather as his dad. Handy when he and his brother inherit the business one day. Yeah, you know, I've been doing this my whole life, so it's just common sense for me. But it's going to take a while before they get to that point. But when they get to that point, then it's, it's all over. My dad, he's like the heart of the business. He does basically everything. He's a master at his craft. But even the master has to surrender to technology. This automated CNC cutter uses a tiny hacksaw to cut the leather, the only automatic machine the Cleggs have. Once the leather is cut, that's when the work really begins. The pieces are then sent through a splitter, which takes layers off the bottom of the leather, bringing everything to a uniform thickness. A skiver shaves the edges to give them an angular effect, which makes for better, stronger stitching, important for leather. So the skiver also allows you to go on an angle. So if you're putting a pocket onto the back of a bag and you want to eliminate the bulk. I think most briefcases are made from leather because they're durable and they look better with age. The briefcase body is now ready for assembly. First, a metal bar gets pushed through the arch of the back panel. The metal bar is to support the top of the briefcase so when you're carrying it, it doesn't sag and also the straps are attached at the end so it has support, supports the whole bag. Then the master gets to work on his craft, sewing pockets onto the inside organizer panel. We use a, a gold color stitch or a yellow stitch, and so we can show the, the, all the details that we do pretty well on that. Meanwhile, the top handle is made. The handle is definitely one of the key elements. It's the, it's the one item that 
you're using all the time. So it's given a robust treatment, threading a metal bar through the two handle pieces, squeezing the outer piece over the inner one. D-rings are then added before Frank uses a rivet setter to bash the brass rivets that hold the handle firmly in place. Another worker details the edges of the body straps. Burning off excess thread with a match seals the thread so it won't unstitch later. Frank can now attach the body straps to the bag, adding the roller buckles to the tail end of the strap. A roller buckle is a buckle that has a roller built in. I've always liked the fact that they treat the leather so well that that's, that's the kind of buckles I tend to use. The bag is given one final buff and polish, and it's ready to be shipped to your office or a bag store near you. I'm thinking like six months to 10 years ahead, whether you're carrying a handbag or a briefcase, it's part of you. There's going to be some time down the future you're going to say, man, that, that's the bag. I'm so happy I get that, and it's my friend. Few pieces of everyday clothing are as misunderstood as a Muslim woman's hijab. So let's set the record straight once and for all. So a misconception that people have with the headscarf is that it's not a choice and that every girl that is Muslim has to wear it. That is 100% not true. The girl chooses to wear it when she wants to wear it. I don't think anybody is forced to do that. I think it's a personal belief and faith. Just because you do wear hijab does not mean that you don't appreciate fashion and you don't have style. It's why the demand for high-end, fashionable headscarves is on the rise. The Middle Eastern market is not an emerging market. It really is the market for fashion. And you see brands from Tom Ford to Dolce & Gabbana embracing the style of clothing that Middle Eastern women want to wear. Modest fashion is a market predicted to have a global worth of $284 billion by 2019. That's four times the bridal wear market, three times the sports footwear market, and double the children's wear market. And at the center of it all is that simple piece of fabric covering the head and neck, the hijab. The practice of veiling or covering certain parts of the body is not something that's purely associated with Islam. It's something that can be found across all of the major Abrahamic religions. If you look at cave paintings from ancient Egypt, if you look at paintings from ancient Rome and Greece, women have always covered their heads. Marwa Atik is the co-founder of Vela Scarves, and she's changing the way we perceive hijabs with her contemporary designs. A born and bred California girl, Marwa was raised in the Sunshine State by her Syrian immigrant parents. Six years ago, she made the huge decision to quit nursing school and start her own design business. I was very passionate about my hijab, and I was really passionate about fashion. She started by sewing in her room, upgrading to her garage, and now she works out of this facility in Los Angeles, California. My main goal is just to get people inspired and just get people excited about wearing the headscarf. I want to bring out the person's confidence and the person's inner style. So I try to keep that in mind in designing. Marwa's working on her spring-summer collection, and it starts with a mood board. I like to always have it as a point of reference just to make sure that I'm staying true to the design. It was a recent trip to the Middle East where she found her latest inspiration. The Dome of the Rock is the most famous Islamic site in Jerusalem. My eye keeps going back to this photo and I'm just drawing inspiration from its colors and its traditional textiles and making sure that I'm just staying true to it. That striking image inspired a scarf called the Ruffle Prima, made from a cerulean blue high multi-chiffon that's adorned with five layers of white or blue ruffles. It's exactly the combination of new and old Marwa's designs are known for. The traditional hijab, it's a very plain canvas. Oftentimes, it might have some textiles or some patterns to it. For me, it's taking something that's not normally on a headscarf and putting it on a headscarf and making it work. Hijabs are relatively simple to produce. Marwa works closely with her production manager, Hector, to evaluate fabric samples. Different blends of fabrics work for different types of scarves in terms of design. A lot of contemporary headscarves are created from chiffon, so they have a very light, um, yet voluminous texture. From here, Hector takes over, creating a digital pattern. The body of this scarf is an angled rectangle, made long enough to pin and wrap. The ruffles are four half circles, each one bigger than the last. That pattern guide helps Hector maximize fabric yield.
Once cut, it's assembled for the sewing line. Here, it receives a rolled hem around the edges, using a single stitch to perfect the embellishing layer. I like how that's skinny, and then this is still thick. Yeah, so let's just do it like that. And in one final swoop, the ruffles are hand-sewn, layering the fabric and securing them to drape around the neck. No one knows how to style a hijab better than Marwa, who's famous for her signature style, the Vela Knot. I just wanted a new style and a new way to wear it. Ever since then, girls all over the world have been styling it in that way as well. I really think it's gonna be a really cool contrast piece for the summer. It looks really good on you. You should have the option to change your look. Just because you can't change your hairstyle doesn't mean that you can't change your hijab. I almost feel today that the hijab is like invisible. There are a lot of women wearing it. What it really comes down to is making it an individual statement and be proud of it. For me, wearing the hijab, it's about allowing people to see me for my personality and allowing people to see my energy and not having it relied on the way that I look or the shape of my silhouette. Easy question. What's the most important item of any outfit? Their shoes. Shoes will always make the outfit. Shoes are a definite statement piece. You can tell the measure of a man by his shoe size. <laughs> and one shoe in particular is making a bigger impact than ever. Every man should own a pair of sneakers. They're so fashionable now. They're comfortable. I own 52 sneakers. Yes. Yes, I have a shoe problem, but it's a good one. And that brings us to the New Balance 998, a classic, sensible street sneaker with a fully customizable color palette. New Balance is one of America's oldest sneaker companies, making running shoes since 1906. And this iconic American sneaker is one of the few still manufactured in the USA. The beauty of a New Balance shoe is that you can dress it up. You can put a jacket on, a blazer, and it really looks good with a nice looking suit. I love to wear sneakers with leather pads and just like white t-shirts. So if you can look good and be comfortable, it's always a win. That's why I have like 60 pairs. This shoe addict is Maria Vicens. She's the plant manager here in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where the popular sneaker is made. And it's worth noting right away, the 998 is no ordinary shoe, unless you want it to be. You get to customize your own shoes. It's going to make you unique and different from everybody else. The look of the 998 is kind of like what I would picture on your streets of New York. The accents you can add are kind of highlight the kind of personality you have. So it's just very trendy, exciting shoe. Needless to say, the Style Factory team would like a pair of custom 998s. But what to do? I'm going full on Rastafarian colors. Red, black, green, and yellow. Go neon, go bright, and make a statement. As you can see, we've gone for blue with neon highlights. You can choose your colors either online or in a New Balance store. Then your custom design is transferred to the production line. We'll turn this dream into a reality. Any shoe is essentially made of two major components, a bottom, AKA the sole, and a top, what shoemakers call an upper. The New Balance tops are made of several small leather pieces that get stitched together. So the manufacturing process starts at cutting. There's two different types of cutting. You have synthetic material, and then the other material we have is your leather material. First, a New Balance associate selects the right color fabric per the shoe's design. Mariano here die cuts nearly 20 individual leather shapes that will make the upper. Meanwhile, both layers of the iconic New Balance letter ends are cut and stuck together by hand. Now, the leather pieces come together to get stitched into the upper, and that's done with this automatic stitching machine. The components are layered onto a vamp, that's this white inner lining, and held in place by small metal spikes. At last, the flat upper is stitched together. Thanks to machines like this, New Balance is able to produce up to 3,000 pairs of shoes every day.
but not before the stitched together uppers go to embroidery, where the custom words are, well, embroidered. One word on each heel. Two words, one love. Boom, Jamaica, hello. Now we have a flat upper, ready to be folded into the foot-shaped shoe top. And that happens in the closing section. That's where the magic happens, because that's when it actually starts looking like the shoe. The final phase of production connects the shoe tops with the pre-made sneaker soles. An associate puts the tops into a steamer to soften the leather. Then a last, basically a foot mold, is stuffed into the cavity. This lasting machine uses heat and glue to mold and lock the upper into its proper shoe shape. So by the time you're done with it, you have your full shoe, less the sole. The pre-cut soles are finally added using a combination of glue, heat, and pressure. The finished shoes are given one final special inspection before being boxed and shipped to their very specific owners with their totally unique styles. I like to rock it with gowns. Yep. You should never wear sneakers to a wedding. So don't do it. Unless you're in a wedding party and they force you to wear it. <laughs>before you were hearing about designers who grew up in Canada but left. But Lucien actually lives here and is making a go of it here. Lucien's cutting edge styles all start with an old fashioned sketch. This develops the silhouette of the dress and separates concept from detail. When I do a sketch for the collection, I always try to think of who's gonna wear the garment. I always try to find purpose first and then I work a little bit backwards. With the sketch in mind, he moves to a Judy. This female dress form is where the design starts to take shape in a cotton fabric called muslin. It's like a um, white material, cotton material, that uh, we make uh, all the garments in the first time so that we see the fit. Um, we change a lot of the lines uh, of the patterns by seeing it on the model. It would be a lot more expensive if we put it directly into the actual fabric because mistakes can happen. And so here we perfect the fit and then we transfer it onto the real material. That material is chiffon, and it's a luxury fabric that was once worn as a sign of wealth and status. Today, its lightweight texture makes it perfect for everything from wedding dresses to lampshades. And it's the ideal canvas for Luchin's hand-painted poppies. When I think about poppy, I think about the little flower that people put on their clothes for remembrance day. Next, the process gets decidedly high-tech. A digital image of his painting is made and printed onto dye sub transfer paper. The patterned paper and chiffon are pressed through a rotary calendar oven. This heats the ink, converts it to a gas, and infuses the dye onto the textile, creating a permanent, high-resolution print. It's almost like uh, the poppy against the blue sky. What we find in nature, I just transferred into fashion. The chiffon is lined up on the cutting table and sealed for protection. Here, a computerized laser cuts each individual part of the dress, from the fitted bodice to the pleated skirt. 
These pieces are brought over to Tatiana, who sews additional layers onto the bodice and sleeves, giving the dress the strength it needs for all those delicate looking pearls that are sewn on by hand. Well, these pearls in particular are coated seven times with mother of pearl. They're essentially indestructible. You have to hammer them really hard for them to break. And like all true pearls, they've got real heft. So the dress needs all four layers to sustain the weight. As for the skirt, each pleat is intricately measured and crimped to create a formal fold. But pleats in general can be complicated. Buyer beware. I actually like pleats. I feel like it makes your silhouette look longer. Um, I think for most women, it's very flattering. But it can be difficult. When you get a pleat that's starting to look like an accordion, that means it's not the pleat for you. So like all things, the pleat's got to suit your body type. Once the dress is sewn and hemmed, Luchin takes it through one last check, making sure the seams line up and the pleats fall perfectly. I would say it needs a beautiful ring and maybe a pair of earrings, not chandelier, something high because of the opulence of the beading around it. Ready to wear by women and first ladies alike. Sophie Trudeau humanized the brand, so women who like her will likely gravitate toward his clothes. And I think he's really put made in Canada style out there to the world.